Jesus did, yes, in giving his life, in going into the grave, in him coming out of that grave, how explosive and powerful that was, and what he did on earth before he went back to the Father. Those are some significant, powerful events. And in this series, um, this is now our third week looking at this. We started the Wednesday after um, Resurrection Sunday. Um, in this series, it's going to be very clear to you. And I'm going to ask that you would just get you some pencils, a pencil or a pen, and get a paper. Um, some people can jot things down or you know type it in quick on your laptop some people can type that fast if that's how you roll that's fine but I want you to take some good notes amen I want you to take good notes because the specificity um, that the Lord is giving me to present this to you you're not gonna you don't hear it all the time but you're here and when you see the lineup all it does is make you bless the Lord the more and just let you see how truly awesome he is and all of his works are magnificent and they cannot be duplicated nobody is God but God. And the more that we um, see his work in detail, the more we're convinced, truly, yes, that he's in a class all by himself. Amen. So that is um, a preempt of our study for today, an introduction of that. And just make sure, even those of you that so beautifully watch online from literally all over the country, thank God for you. Thank God for you tuning in. I want you, if you can, some kind of way to take down these notes because we're going to be very clear in how we lay it out. With that said, let us bow our heads together for a word of prayer. So, Lord, we are so grateful to you for all of your many, many blessings to us. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. We thank you that you woke us up this morning. And yes, you, Lord, started us on our way. We thank you, Lord, for our heart beating and our blood flowing and the activity of our limbs. It's a blessing and a gift from you. And we say thank you. Above all this, Lord, we thank you that we know you in the pardon of our sins. We thank you that we are blood washed, that we are forgiven. We thank you that the Holy Spirit lives in us. We thank you, Lord, for those of us who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the power that you give us to walk in as believers to do your will and to perform your ministry. Lord, we thank you for every benefit and every blessing. And as we gather here today, we thank you that you are in our midst. Let your presence be made known. Let your anointing to teach and to receive be active among us. And Lord, when we come to the end of this study, may we all know that we have received the words of life from you, Lord. Not from me, for without you, I'm nothing. But Lord, you speak, you lead, you guide, you teach through your servant. And we will give you the glory and all of the praise in Jesus' name. And the people of the Lord said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We are looking today. We'll start right where we ended. And on today, I thank God for Sister Sherry. Amen. Our camera operator, she heard me last week say, I would like to have a Mike, in case I ask you all a question and I want you to answer or you have something that you will want to ask. Um, and Sister Sherry made that mic available. So I'm appreciative of that. There are times that I'm trying to get to a certain spot in the lesson or get certain material um, 
complete it before we end. And so I may sometimes say, let's hold that question or hold that thought. If I say that to you, please make sure you write it down so that um, at the end of our study, we can talk about it. But there may be some time today that I might want to give you an opportunity to elaborate. And Sister Sherry has made that available for us. We're turning to Matthew chapter 27. We spent quite a bit of time last week really looking at this, so I don't have to reteach it, amen? All we have to do is just kind of um, review it, go over it. Um, how many, how many um, utterances or sayings did Jesus say from the cross while he was on the cross? How many utterances did he speak? He spoke seven various utterances. And the first one was absolutely precious because after what he had been through all that night and all that morning leading up to his crucifixion, the first thing he said from the cross was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's some kind of love. That's some kind of savior. Amen. And then um, the last thing that Jesus said from the cross, um, the last word that he spoke um, after he cried out, it is finished. In other words, the work of redemption had been paid for in full. It is finished. And then he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And so that's where um, our lesson picks up on today. When we look at Matthew chapter 27 verse 50, um, when he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I want to give you that exact verse where he said that because he did not say that in Matthew. I think it came from, yes, it's, it's Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Luke 23, verse 46. Jesus cried with a loud voice and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he was talking about his human spirit. He was talking about the fact that physically he was dying. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. That means he died. Now that's Luke, amen. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, verse 46. And it's important for you to know this. The Gospels, there are four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the Gospels are written in um, a way that we call them the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic is that prefix sin. S-Y-N, it means same, it means same. And so there's four different men and they're looking at the same events. And so sin, what did I say S-Y-N means? Same. same, like synonym, it means the same. And optic is view. So they're looking at the same scene, the same view. Four different men, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Matthew and John were a part of the 12 disciples that were with Christ during his public ministry. And Luke and Mark, they were close to those 12, but they were not a part of the original 12. But they were very close to them, and they saw many of the works and the miracles that Jesus did. And then also, they were told and given information from the original, from the original 11 disciples. They were given that information. I said 11 and not 12, because they didn't get, he didn't get anything. Mark and Luke didn't get anything from Judas. All right. Judas, after he realized what he had done, he, he took his own life. Amen. So 
um, Mark and Luke were very close companions with the other 11 disciples, and they too were eyewitnesses of many of Jesus, much of his ministry and many of his miracles. But they saw what they saw, all looking at the same thing, but they saw it from their own perspective. And God, when he used them to write the gospel record, he allowed them to tell it even though they were moved, what? They were moved by the Holy Ghost to write what they wrote. They told it from their frame of reference. And so when we want to look at all that happened in Jesus' life and in his ministry, you really have to take all four of the Gospels, and we call them the synoptic Gospels. What do we call them? And we have to look at each viewpoint. And they don't contradict one another. Actually, they complement one another. But when you put them all together, you get a full picture of the whole thing. So Matthew does not record um, the words of Jesus that said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. That word is not um, written in Matthew, nor is it written in Mark. But Luke heard that and he wrote it. So to get the seven sayings of Jesus, we cannot turn to one gospel and get all of the seven sayings. You have to go to each one and um, each one records at least one or two of um, the things that Jesus said from the cross. And so, um, in this case, these final words, this final word that Jesus spoke, Luke actually recorded the words. But when we look at Matthew 27, verse 50, it just says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. What doesn't Matthew tell us? Matthew doesn't say what Jesus said. Said He just heard the cry out. Amen. He heard the loud cry out. And he saw that Jesus died, but he did not hear the specific words. It is Luke that got the specific words that Jesus cried out with that loud voice um, and then died. And those words were, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Spirit. I can't whisper it, can I? Because the scripture said he cried out, amen, with a loud voice. And it was really, it was triumphant. He finished it, amen. He finished what his father has sent him here to earth to do, what he willingly offered his life up to do. He offered himself to come down to earth so that he could redeem us from death, from hell, and from the works of the enemy. So now, in verse 50, we're in Matthew verse 50, and we're going to look at what happened after Jesus died on the cross. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. What did he say when he cried out with that loud voice? Very, I commend my spirit. Okay, start your notes, y'all. Okay, and we see that in Luke uh, 23, 46, verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent. That means it was torn in two. It says in twain. Twain is two, an old English word for two. From what? From the top to the bottom. And that indicated that it was a divine act from the top, way up at the top of where? Where was that veil hanging from? It was hanging from the top of the temple and it covered the Holy of Holies. It went from one end of the Holy of Holies to the other end and it separated the inner court from what is called 
the Holy of Holies. That veil separated. And the only one that could go behind that veil was the chief priest or the high priest. At that time, he was the only one. And we talked about how he had to do preparation and make sure his he had done all of his sacrifices and he had you know, made atonement for his own personal sin. He had to purify and sanctify himself before he could go back and make intercession on behalf of Israel and behalf of the people. That's what was done behind the curtain, the veil. The sins of the people were uh, presented to the Father, to God the Father, from the high priest. He was, he was, the high priest, was the intercessor for Israel at that time. And he had to do that um, from time to time to make sure that the sins of the nation were covered. Amen. That the wrath of God wouldn't come against the nation or against the people. And only, only the chief priest could go behind that veil. And when Jesus died, from top to bottom, that veil was torn in two. And God was making a declaration without words. He said, no more separation. No more will you have to go through a man to get my favor. My son now has paid the price. And what has he done? He's opened up the way so that now we can come to the Lord directly ourselves. I want you to hold that spot right there, and I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 4 because the scripture says it so beautifully. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Sing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Who is our great high priest, y'all? Jesus, thus the, not a, amen, but the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Let's not be wishy-washy. Today I'm saved and tomorrow I don't know. But hold fast our profession. I'm a born-again believer. Jesus is my Savior. Yesterday, today, and let that be our profession. Amen. Every day thereafter. Verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. In, in other words, he's not untouchable. It's not that he's uncaring. He careth for us. That's what it means, cannot be touched. He's moved by what we deal with and go through. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points, somebody say every point, every point tempted just like we are, but there's one difference, yet without sin, the difference in Jesus and us, because he was fully human, amen, he lived this life and he knows what we deal with, what we go through, how we're tempted, tested, and tried, he understands, amen, we can't say to him, but you don't understand, Jesus. He's, oh, no. I came all the way from heaven down. I took on a body so that I can understand and relate to you. But although he was tested and tempted at every point, just like you and I, he never yielded to sin. It says, yet without sin. He was sinless tempted but never yielded to temptation but he can understand and relate to our cry amen and to our situations verse 16 let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace we don't have to be scared 
Amen. That high priest, when he went behind the Holy of Holies, he was nervous, y'all. He was hoping that he had done his rituals to the extent that he would go behind that veil and not drop dead because he had still some impediment or blemish or spot in his life. So he was nervous. He was, you know, he was in fear of the wrath of God because that's how it was before grace came. Hallelujah. You dealt with the wrath of God and the high priest was our representative. But now it says we don't have to be afraid. But because of Jesus, we can come boldly to the throne of what? Not judgment. Hallelujah. But the throne of grace, God's righteousness at Christ's expense. We can come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain or receive mercy. Not judgment, not condemnation, but receive, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When that veil was rent into, Jesus, um, the Father actually, his declaration without words was, we're no longer separated. Jesus now is the high priest and he has gone the way for you and because he's opened up the way you can come to me you can come look boldly to me we don't have to hold our head down we don't have to say i'm just a miserable worm i'm just a poor sinner saved by grace no we can come and say thank you father because of your son, I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. And I come to you in faith, knowing you hear me and you can help, you can help me. Yes. Amen. You have everything that I need. And then when we do, we'll find help. Amen. We don't just come, but we will actually find grace to help in the time of need. And so that is what was um, exemplified when the veil was torn into could not have been done by human hands the thickness of the of that veil the thickness of it actually dictated there was no way that human hands could have torn it um, not only from top to bottom but also is thickness but it was a divine act of the my, almighty God saying now People who have faith in me can come to me through my son, Jesus Christ. Now, then it says, um, after the veil was torn, I'm at 51, and I'm at the end of 51. And the, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The rocks, like a, it was an earthquake, okay? And what we talked about last week, look here, let me go to 52. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept, that didn't mean they were taking a nap. It means they were physically dead. But it called it sleep because they died in faith, and they knew that they would rise again. Amen. Only for the saints is death referred to as sleep. Amen. Because why we know we're right, we died in, in faith, therefore our spirit and soul are alive, but our body is dead, but we know there will be a resurrection of the body. Amen. And it says here that when Jesus died, it said at the end of 51, the earth did quake, the rocks rent, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves when? After his resurrection. Hmm. All right. And what else did they do? They didn't just come out of the grave. They went, they went visiting, y'all. <laughs> and went into the holy city and appeared unto how many? It says many. They appeared unto many. Now, 
there, what I taught us last week, this statement from verse 51 all the way to 53, that's those verses, 51, 52, 53, are literally covering a three-day period. They are covering the day that Jesus died, and they is covering, let me say, he died, the veil of the temple was rent. That was in 50, that was 51. And then it also, it leaps over to the fact that when Jesus got out of the grave, which was on the third day, he didn't get out of the grave by himself. But other saints got out of the grave with him. And listen, it was not just their soul and their spirit that got out of the grave. They experienced a resurrection. Amen. They, what did it say? And verse 52, and the graves were open and many bodies, come on now, can you highlight that? The bodies of the saints which were dead arose, amen, which slept, were, arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, that, those three verses literally are covering three days. And then when we get to verse 54, we go back to the scene, in, in verse 54, we go back to the scene right there on Golgotha's hill when Jesus died. Now, look at verse 54. Now, when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earth quake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. They feared greatly. Okay? Now, by the end of the Bible study, I'm going to, mm, I'm going to go back and I'm going to deal with the saints that got up out of the grave. I'm going to go back to that. But I want to, us to move forward here on today. So the centurion were Roman soldiers, and that means about 100 soldiers. It wasn't that it was 100 soldiers there in Golgotha, but this were, there were um, some soldiers that were part of the centurion that were there, and one in particular said, truly this man was a son of God. He watched everything that happened over these six hours. He was charged with watching Jesus and guarding that scene. And he knew he was convicted to his heart. This was a wrong death. This was a rogue happening. This man was who he says he was. He, he heard the gospel without somebody preaching it. He saw it in action. Amen? Now let's look at verse 55. And many women were beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him. So um, there, these were women that came from Galilee that were part of the group of believers that followed Jesus and believed in him. Verse 56, among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and, mother, and the mother of Zebedee's children. Um, that mother, her son's names were James and John, Zebedee's sons. So women came from Galilee, and they were there on Golgotha Hill. They witnessed up close Jesus dying. And the ones that are named in particular are Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and then Zebedee's, um, James and John's mother. Amen. Now, 
um, it, I would say right here in this particular verse, it doesn't say Mary, his mother, Jesus' mother. Now, we know she was there at the cross just about to the end because one of the sayings that Jesus said from the cross was, Mother, behold your son. And he was telling his mother Mary, look at John, my beloved disciple, who was right there too. He now is going to take care of you, Mom. And he said to John, John, behold your mother. And so it says from that day forth, John took Mary home and he was a son to her in the place of Jesus. He took care of her. And the fact that that had to happen is indicative to us that Joseph, her husband, had already died by this time. Now, if Joseph was still alive, she wouldn't have needed someone to have taken care of her. And I just think that is just so amazing that Jesus, while he's dying like he's dying, and all he's going through and all that he's bearing, he took time to take care of his mother. That's just amazing. So for much of the time, I would say up until the last hour, if not the last moment, Mary, Jesus' mom, was there as well as John the Beloved. But here they mentioned those three women that were there. 57, when the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself, uh-huh, was Jesus' disciple. So there, Jesus had many disciples beyond the 12. The 12 were those that, they traveled, they slept with him, they ministered and everything, but he had many other disciples that followed him and that met him from place to place as he went about preaching and healing and establishing the kingdom of God. So Joseph of Arimathea, and the word of the Lord says, he was a follower of Jesus and he was a rich man. 58, he went to Pilate and begged for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body of Jesus to be delivered or for the body of Jesus to be given to Joseph of Arimathea. We talked about how Jesus' body had to be taken off of the cross before 6 p.m. Saturday because the Sabbath was starting and they needed to take Jesus down before this high holy Sabbath would begin. And so um, when they went to break his legs to expedite his death, Jesus had already, amen, gone into paradise. So now we're concerned with what? Getting his body off the cross. 59, and when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Um, there's a lot of talk, I'm sure you all have heard about it, called uh, the shroud. And, you know, there's discussion. Was this literally the linen cloth that Jesus' body was wrapped in right here? Um, there's discussion back and forth. They're dating it. Only the Lord knows, you know. But it's interesting how some of supposedly the imprint that's on that linen cloth that they keep um, securely, I believe, in um, Rome, that much of the imprint would match being a cover that would have the imprint of somebody's body like Jesus died. So it's, it's interesting. And um, that documentary, if you ever want to look it up, I think it would, it would be um, mind provoking. So he took Jesus' body, wrapped it in a clean, a clean linen cloth, and he laid it in his own new tomb in his own new tomb. So Joseph, amen, had already purchased the tomb. It was brand new, and no one had ever laid in it, which he had hewn out in the rock. Joseph had hewn this um, tomb out himself, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. I just want to say something right here. Um, in verse 60, I am always moved 
by the way, the righteous take care of their deceased. How they reverence and they are careful how they handle the remains of their loved ones who have departed. Um, one of the first times I see this is when Sarah, Abraham's wife, died. And Abraham took a large amount of money. He went down and negotiated um, with um, these very well-off people. It's called, um, right now that name escapes me, but it was in the plane of memory that he went. And he negotiated, you know, he was, he, they knew he was not of him, but Abraham had good relationships with them because he was an honorable man and he conducted himself well. So Abraham was able to buy um, a whole field for all of his family so that when they died, they would be placed there. And um, he buried his wife there. That's where all of his family, all of Abraham's family members were buried there. Um, it was their burial place. And then if you think about it moving forward, when Joseph died, in chapter 50 of Genesis, he said, now, the Lord is going to visit you just like, he's going to visit you just like I told you he was. You're going to be here, but at a certain time, he's going to visit you, and he's going to deliver you and bring you into the land that he promised. When you all leave Egypt, when you leave and you're headed to the promised land, he said, you make sure you get my bones and take me up out of here with you. I want to go to the promised land with you. And so, yeah, again, so we can see Joseph like David. They died in hope of the promise. They knew that there was more. Amen. And when I look at this and the care that is being taken, here Joseph, you know, this man who was a rich man and he was a Jew and he followed Jesus, he took the time to take Jesus' remains from that cross and put him in that buried tomb and wrapped it and handled it handled the Lord's remains a certain way. We're talking about the physical aspect of Jesus. And then he himself, and it didn't say he had a whole lot of folk with him. It didn't say he and his servants. It says, and he rolled a great stone to the door. Joseph did that. This is not Joseph, Jesus' daddy. This is Joseph of Arimathea. Mm -hmm. And he rolled that great stone to the door of the sepulcher. And then he left. Now, I just bring this up to say, there are so many believers today that are doing cremation. And I would just say, from what I read in scripture, what I read in scripture, and a lot of times what scripture doesn't do is take a lot of time to write a thesis about something. You learn what God thinks by what God does. <laughs> Hallelujah. You look at what he does and it's like, oh, this is the principle. This is the pattern. This is the way. Amen. That's why I went all the way back to Genesis and looked at, this is how the righteous handled their dead. You will not find, and if you do find it, I will stand corrected, but I have never found where the righteous cremated their loved ones. And here we see how they handle Jesus' body. Sometimes it's done because of an economical choice, but I just will encourage you, just check the scriptures out for yourself and amen I would encourage you follow the pattern of the word the word is a pattern it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path if the righteous today get cremated does that mean they won't get resurrected no 
No, because we, uh, a righteous person could burn up in a fire. Um, so um, our resurrection isn't dependent upon how we die or, you know, what happens to this. What does it say? Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. That's ultimately um, what's going to happen to the, this physical body. But watch the pattern of how the remains of the righteous are dealt with. And I encourage you, follow the pattern. All right, I'm going to keep on moving. Verse 61, and there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. So Mary Magdalene, we saw her at the cross, and the other Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and so they, they stayed right there. And they let Joseph go get permission. They saw Joseph take down the body. They saw Joseph lay the body in the tomb. Sepulcher. Everybody say sepulcher. We have, a, we have an issue saying that word. We say all kind of things. <laughs> but, but they were right there and they were looking. This is called commitment. This is called love. They went all the way. They went as far as they could go. And they noted where Jesus' body was being placed. Look at verse 62. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation. Now the day of preparation, the day of preparation was the day that they prepared. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I said something incorrect earlier. The day of preparation was the day that they prepared for for the Sabbath. And so it was Friday, okay? The day of preparation. What, did, what are they preparing for? They're preparing for the high holy Sabbath day. And this was not just any Sabbath day. This was Passover. This, at this time, is Passover. So they're doing much preparation. What, what was the need for preparation? One of the main things, remember, the Jewish people had a very strong understanding that they did not labor on the Sabbath. So they, any work or any food preparation, anything, they had to get that done on Friday. And it had to be done on Friday by 6 o'clock. I think I said earlier, Saturday at 6. That was incorrect. It had to be done by Friday, amen, at 6 o'clock. When Jesus died, it was, we call it, good Friday, and he had to be off of that cross by Friday, 6 o'clock, because at 6 o'clock, that's when the high holy day started, and it went from Friday at 6 o'clock all the way through to Saturday at 6 o'clock. Saturday, 6 o'clock, the high holy day ended. You all got that? Okay. So, now the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together. This was on the Sabbath, you all. Passover. <laughs> Saying, sir, we remember that deceiver said, they talking about Jesus, while he was yet alive, he said that after three days, I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Isn't that interesting? They refer to it as an error. <laughs> they knew that they had lied, amen. And that was what you would call a Freudian slip, amen. And he said, so then our last error will be what? Worse than the first. What do you, what, what do you, what do you think they meant? The last error will be worse than the first. Yeah, they were, they're referring to the fact that they killed him. And how, how could that be worse? Because if he really gets up, 
Oh my goodness, then all the people are going to be upset with us and say what? He was who he said he was. And then they're like, oh, then we're going to really be in trouble. Uh-huh. So we got to keep this thing what? Undercover. Okay? So in verse 65, Pilate said unto them, Okay, they came together and they went to Pilate and they said this. In verse 65, Pilate said to them, you have a watch. So what he did, he granted them soldiers to be on guard at the, at the tomb. He, that's what a watch is. You have a, a, um, a group of soldiers that will guard this tomb of Jesus. Go your way, make it as sure as you can. I think that Pilate knew that they were up against an unbeatable foe. So you, you do it, you, you make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher what? Sure. Sealing the stone. Now who had put the stone in front of the door of the sepulcher? Joseph of Arimathea. But now, look it. He said, Pilate said, you go and do whatever you can. Now, Pilate was already moved that Jesus was an innocent man. He knew something was fishy about it, but he didn't have the courage to stand up and say, you know what, you all can go tell, um, you can go tell um, Caesar anything you want. You can say, anything you want. This is an innocent man and I'm not having nothing to do with this. I'm releasing this man. And y'all, because they were like, if you, if you don't let, if you let Jesus go, what is it? If you let Jesus go, then we'll go tell Caesar that you're upholding another king. And it made him scared. It made him scared. <laughs> Amen. But he already has beheld Jesus and saw his nature and he was already knowing that something was amiss here. So he said, you go and you make it as sure as you can and beside that he gave him a watch, a guard um, to watch, amen, the tomb. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now, this is what's going on, saints, on the earth. That's what's going on on the earth. <laughs> there's, a, there's a real body. It's wrapped. It's laying in the tomb. And there's Mary and the other Mary, and they're watching everything. And then they go about their way. And the next time we see them is on Sunday morning. Amen. Mary and Mary. That next time we see them is Sunday morning. But while Jesus' body is laying in Joseph's tomb on earth, it's a whole nother scene going on in the grave at the same time. Can I hear you say at the same time? At the same time. Amen. So we know when he died, the veil rent in two and the earthquake, but let's see then after that what happened. And I think where we want to go is to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. How are you all doing? You taking good notes? Okay, this is, so we just described the scene of what's happening on earth. Now, um, let's look at What's happening below the earth? First Peter chapter 3. Now, I think before... Now, I'm going to leave it right there. Okay? Verse 18. First Peter chapter 3 verse 18. And then I'll go to Ephesians 4 after that. If, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. And that, if you could highlight that, hath once suffered for sins, he, we talked about it, but I don't want us to miss it. 
He paid for all the sins of the world, all the sins that ever had been committed, all the sins that were being committed the day he died, all the sins that would be committed in the future, even up until this point, even until the point where the rapture occurs. Jesus has died for all sins, and he did it once, y'all. He didn't have to die seven times. He didn't ask us to die. He died. He asked us to live, amen, live and proclaim the gospel. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. And so it says here, for Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death, how? In the flesh. He died what? Physically, but made alive or quickened. That's what quickened means. Made alive by the Spirit, by which also, in other words, by the Spirit also, not only was he just made alive by the Spirit, but by the Spirit he went and preached unto the spirits that were in prison. Another word you, you could put there, maybe in parentheses, are in captivity. He preached to the other souls that were in captivity. Okay? By the Holy Spirit, capital S, he, he went and he preached unto the spirits. He didn't, notice it doesn't say the people. He preached to spirits. It also doesn't say, it doesn't say holy spirits, and it doesn't say unholy. It didn't make a distinct, um, a distinction. He preached, so I take that to understand, he preached to all the spirits. He preached to all the spirits that were captive, where? In the grave. Amen? Like, um, we looked at what David said um, in Psalm 116 when he said, I know that you're not going to leave me in the grave. They were in the grave. All these spirits, remember, the spirit and the soul, they exist forever. They exist forever. And they were in the grave. Now, right there, Turn to Luke 19. Luke 19. He preached to the souls in captive that are captive, are in prison. They're in prison, but that he preached to them, what does that let us know? That they're alive. What does that let us know? They're in, they're in the grave. What? What? He went down into the grave and he's preaching to them. Do you, all do, do you all see that um, Jesus went into the grave? I, I want to see that word. I want to make sure it's, it says that. 1 Peter 3. It says the spirit in prison. The spirits in prison. He preached to the spirits in prison. And what I'm saying to you that that prison is great is the grave but I will you know I will bear that out from the scripture okay I want to look at that being put to death in the flesh but made alive by the spirit by which also he went and preached into the spirits okay which were in prison how do you know that's how do you know that's the grave sister Levette which sometime in verse 20 were disobedient. When were they disobedient, some of these spirits that he preached to? When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So listen, it's letting us know that he didn't just preach to the righteous spirits but he also preached to the unrighteous spirits because it makes a reference to those who mocked 
and um, made a joke out of Noah and what God told him to do. Now, we know that those people are dead. <laughs> so this is... This is letting us know that Jesus went into the grave and he didn't go into the grave and just lay there. He didn't go in the grave and just look. What does the scripture say he went into the grave and do? He went into the grave and preached. <laughs> preached to the souls. And the reason why it says they were in prison, because particularly for the righteous dead, this was a holding place for them. This was not their eternal home. Amen. So now let's find out about this prison that Jesus went down and visited. And you're looking at Luke chapter 16. I said 19. Chapter 16, verse 19. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a rich man clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate, and he was full of sores. I taught this in detail last week. You can pull, you can get the CD from last week, and I really, but now I'm just going to read through it, okay? Um, in verse 21, now Lazarus, who sat at the gate, and he was full of sores, desired to be fed only with the crumbs. He didn't ask for a plate of food. He only wanted the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, giving him some kind of relief. Couldn't take him to the doctor. The dogs came and gave him some kind of relief. And it came to pass that the beggar died that was Lazarus, and was carried away by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom is in the grave. Okay? It's another reference to that prison because it's not the final resting place of the righteous dead. But when you talk about Abraham's bosom, that's the place that the righteous dead went to. Another name for Abraham's bosom is paradise. Jesus told the thief on the cross, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And what we're just finding out right now is that Jesus on that day when he died did not go to heaven, but he went to the lower parts of the earth. He went and preached to the souls that were in prison. He went to Abraham's bosom. All right? Amen. So here, Lazarus is carried into Abraham's bosom. Now, this is a, this is a couple of years before Jesus died. This is before Jesus died, okay? Lazarus, so in other words, when Jesus got the, down there on that Friday evening, was Lazarus there or not there? He was there. Amen. I'm just making sure you are tracking. Amen. So Lazarus is already there waiting. Amen. Waiting for the Messiah. The rich man also died, y'all, and was buried. Up and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So this lets us know that even before Jesus died, that the grave had two compartments. There was a compartment, a compartment for the righteous dead, and we're going to find out a little bit more what it's like. And there's a compartment for the unrighteous dead. How? Why do we say unrighteous? Because the rich man wouldn't have gone to hell if he was righteous. He went to hell because what was revealed to him of God, he rejected it. Yes. Amen. If you accepted the revelation 
of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if you accepted the revelation, you went to Abraham's bosom when you died. But every one of those people that heard the prophets, that heard the faith, that heard of the promise and rejected it, they went to hell. Amen. So we know that, that the grave has two compartments here at this time. And the rich man went to hell, and he was already in torment. So it was already an unfavorable punishing place. Uh -huh, in verse 24, and the rich man, okay, and in hell, verse 23, he lifts up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Isn't that, pre isn't that precious? He was, Lazarus wasn't on the outskirts. He was in the center of Abraham's bosom. He had found rest. Yeah. Amen. Now, verse 24. And he, talking about the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham, now he's father, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in the flame. So the, the fire in hell was already burning before Jesus died on the cross. Because faith has been revealed to us clearly ever since Father Abraham. And we actually could go before that, but we could just, you know, because this is Abraham's bosom. Faith was, and when faith was revealed and whoever was revealed to, when they embraced that revelation, it was accounted unto them for righteousness. They didn't know like we know. They didn't have what we have. But what they had and what was revealed, if they hearkened, if those people during Noah's time would have hearkened when he said, God told me it's going to rain, those people would have been saved from that flood, amen? And they would not have been on the hell side of the grave. And, but they rejected the revelation of God. They rejected the revelation of faith, and therefore they ended up, when they died, going into hell and punishment. And so this is something we know about Abraham's bosom. Abraham is there. It's a calm place. There's water there. <laughs> it's a cool place. And there's no, there's no conflict. Mm -hmm. So th this is what it tells us. And this, um, and this man, rich man, he was self-absorbed, he was proud, he was selfish and egotistical and didn't have thoughts for the poor and he didn't have time for God. And now he's going to try to call out Father Abraham. Little late, little late. So it doesn't, you, it shows us you can't switch sides after death. We got to embrace faith while we're alive. Amen. While the blood is still warm in our bodies, we have to say, yes, Lord, I believe today, the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Because if you die in unbelief, you will be unholy for the rest of eternity. Amen. And so Abraham said, and Abraham called him son. Verse 25. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Abraham's bosom was a place of comfort, but only the righteous dead were there. Now, this is key, verse 26. And Abraham said, and beside all this, so you can see, look it, can I guess, can I tell you something right here? You can see when you, when the, even in, under the old covenant, under the old covenant, when they died, they weren't just out. They're talking 
Abraham is talking. Abraham is comforting. They're seeing, and, and guess what else? They are knowing. They are recognized. Amen? Lazarus was re recognized. So what? Because they are they have life. They have, they have life in their spirit and in their soul, but they just don't have what? A body. They don't have a body. And then Abraham speaks, and he says, beside all this, between, now look at this, between, where is it? Between us and you, there is a great golf fix. Now, what did it say in verse 23 about Abraham? It said, no, I'm sorry, in 23, it said, the rich man looked and he beheld Abraham afar off. So the way I see this is side by side, but afar off, that he had to look away, but yet over there he could see Abraham. Amen. The rich man afar off could see, amen, Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. It's like, well, just, just let him come on over. He don't have to stay, and I don't need a bucket. Just, if he could just dip his, they say the tip, the tip of his finger in the water, in the cool water. It was cool water. And cool my tongue, because I'm I'm tormented in these flames. He said, even if we could, he said, you made your decision when you were on earth, but even beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Somebody say, it's fixed. It's fixed. So that, who fixed it? God fixed it. God, it's fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from where you are. There, we, it ain't no crossing over. Amen. The, you, you, the crossover from death to life have to happen on this side of the grave. Amen. Once you get down in the grave, the choice, the the option to make a choice is over. The choice is already made. And so the, the, the way you should see it is that there's two compartments, and in between the two, there's this great gulf, and God fixed it so one group could not cross over to the other group. They have entered into their eternity. This is what the grave looked like when Jesus um, died, when he died on that day. And when he died, when we go back to 1 Peter 3, it says he preached to the souls or the spirits, small s, that means the human spirits, the human spirits and souls. He preached to the spirits that were in prison. And it made no distinction between holy or unholy. So in what I envision in trying to be true to scripture is that Jesus landed um, in that gulf. <laughs> that he landed in. And right there, he could see both groups. And I already told you last week, he just preached one message. He didn't, he, and, and I could be wrong, but I don't believe that Jesus, Jesus didn't have to preach damnation because they already had died in unbelief. What he preached was, I believe, is I am the promise fulfilled. I am he that came through 42 generations, amen. From the loins of Abraham through the tribe of Judah, I am Mary's baby that was conceived in her womb by the working of the Holy Ghost. And I've given my blood spotless and pure and without sin to redeem all of those that died in hope of my coming. Amen. David died in the hope. Amen. And all, I came to redeem all those that died in the hope. Just that message to the uh, um, righteous dead 
it was joy to their ears. Amen. It was joy, joy, joy. And to the unrighteous dead that had died, but unbelieving and denying and rejecting, it was great sorrow and great gnashing of teeth. Perhaps, maybe, maybe they might have thought, if we are in all this torment all these many years, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll be able to get out. But they found out, not so. And everybody, everybody, if you could share this message, amen, if you could share this message today, come on, today, hallelujah, today is the day of salvation. The Lord said, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart, as in the day of provocation. And all along the way, there's been a time, and the Lord gave people time, and then he said, this is it. Those people in Noah's day, they had a time. Even when, they, when Noah was building the ark, they had 120 years. Then he said, God said, load the animals on the ark. It took seven days to load that ark. They had those seven, he going in the ark. They had a time. But when God shut that door, time was over. It was no more opportunity for them to make a change. So it is today. Amen. So it is now. Today is that day. Now is the time. Don't be caught like these people that we're reading about that Amen. The rich man represents. They, they thought they had heaven on earth, but they found out when they were in the grave on the hell side. Amen. H-E-L-L. -L, that, oh my, they have rejected grace one time too many. And for eternity, that would be their destination. Well, Jesus also did something else. Amen. He, uh, it's time to go. It's time to go. Amen. Colossians 2 says, he spoiled all the principalities and powers of darkness. Do you know the devil tried? He, 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 he would say, the devil would have said, I killed him. I killed him on that cross. Jesus said, didn't nobody take my life? I, I laid it down. But from the devil's point of view, because he was deceived, he would say, oh, I killed him. And he felt like he won. But I'm sure when he saw Jesus come down there to the grave, he should have been getting nervous. Because he wasn't coming down there limping. He came down there in power preaching. And I'm sure, I'm sure the devil began to tremble. Uh-oh. He coming in here in power. I'm sure he tried his utmost to hold him in hell. To hold him in the grave. To hold him from rising again. Because, you know, Satan knew the script. He knew that Jesus said, you, you, you kill this body, and in three days I'll rise again. Satan heard the words that Jesus spoke. Amen. It wasn't a secret. But the Bible tells us that Jesus made an open show, triumphing over the enemy in the grave. All that he tried to do to block him, to stop him, to thwart the plan of salvation, he was, the enemy was defeated, and the Lord Jesus was victorious. And then when we go to Revelation chapter 1, and we look at verse 18, Revelation 1, I want to look at the end of 17, the end of verse 17, Revelation 1, the end of 17. This is Jesus talking. In my Bible, it's in red. <laughs> if you have a red letter edition, Jesus is talking in first person. And he said, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. A amen. And have the keys of 
hell and death. If you can write authority under keys, keys mean I got to say so now over hell and death. Do you know the devil had authority, amen, over death? He had the authority over death because the authority that God gave to Adam, Adam gave it over to the devil. But God didn't let it in there. God sent his son. His son did the work on the cross. Then he went into the grave. He preached, amen, and before he got up out of there, he let it be clear, amen, I'm taking everything back that Adam squandered. I'm taking back the authority. And sometimes we do it literally with the keys. <laughs> Give me them keys, amen. You don't say who dies and who lives, amen. I now have that authority because I am he, the savior that has given my life to redeem mankind, amen. And with that, y'all, the Lord Jesus got up out of the grave. He preached. Amen. He took the authority. He trampled over all the power of the enemy. And when he got out of the grave, and this is our last scripture, I got, this is the last, I say, I'm, oh, my, my, my. I want to give you one more scripture after this. I just want to conclude where we started. Matthew 27. Matthew 27. And I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop at Matthew 27. All right, now start at Ephesians 4 next week. Matthew 27, just so we end where we started, okay? Now, when you look at verse 52, 52, okay? So this now, when 52, this is not, the day Jesus died in Matthew 27, 52. This is the day Jesus got up from the grave. This is the day he rose. This is the first day of the week. Amen. And this occurred before Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, came back to the tomb early that Sunday morning. This happened before Mary Magdalene got to the tomb. What happened? 52. And the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Amen. Jesus preached I am the promised one, and I came to do what my father said. Amen. He got the authority from the devil, and then he said, Abraham, it's time to shake the spot. <laughs> Praise God. And Jesus, what, did, what does the word say? He is the firstborn from among the dead. He got up first. Amen. He rose first. He is the first one to resurrect from the dead. But when he got up and opened up that grave, all of the dead saints that came up with him. That's who those people are. That's who they are. They were all the Old Testament, even up until that thief that died on the cross that day. All of them that went to Abraham's bosom. Why did they go to Abraham's bosom? Because they couldn't go to heaven. Because the way to go to heaven had not been opened up yet. Amen. Jesus had to come and give his blood to redeem us so that we could be fit for heaven. And he, he even had to die for the saints that already had died. His blood had to cover their sins so that they could go to heaven. Amen. That all righteousness would be fulfilled. After he put his blood over them, he said, let's get up out of here. And when he got up, the word says they got up. Amen. And they walked around. And as pastor taught us on Sunday, Acts 1-3, they walked around earth in their glorified state, resurrected state, for 40 days. And you might say, well, Sister Levette, how do you know 
They didn't just stay walking around. Or how do you know? They didn't die again. The Lord Jesus said when they walked around in their bodies, that is a resurrection. <laughs> he, their soul and their spirit were reunited with their body. And they too had a glorified body like Jesus. But they couldn't get their glorified body until he got his first. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And they came up out of the grave and walked around the earth for 40 days. Now next week, we will finish this because it's not, it's not finished, and amen, until we'll say, then what did Jesus do? What did what, he do? You, you could read the story, Matthew chapter 28, <laughs> amen, and you could read it in Luke, you could read it in John, but next week we will cover that, amen? amen? Praise the Lord. I pray all minds are clear. Let's give the Lord a hand praise for his word. Praise God for his truth. And thank God. Thank God. Just like he kept his word concerning them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just like he kept his word concerning them, concerning David and Abraham, he came and got them just like he said he would. He's going to keep his word concerning us. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory, glory. So you know what? Just look up. Because our redemption draweth nigh. He's a promise keeper. Amen. He is keeping his promise concerning us. And I'll, I'll say this, my final word. Now today, there is no more two compartments in the grave. That's done away with. Abraham's bosom is emptied out. It's gone. It's not there anymore. Hell literally has enlarged itself. And if you die rejecting Christ as your Savior, immediately your soul and spirit go straight to hell. If you die having accepted Jesus as your Savior, just accept him from your heart. Confess him with your mouth. When you die, immediately your soul and spirit go straight into the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We don't have to make a stop off at Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom ain't there no more because Abraham is up in glory too. Amen. And we'll talk about that next week. <laughs> when did he get there? We'll talk about that next week. God bless you. 6 p.m. intercessory prayer. Please join us. 7 p.m. pastoral Bible teaching with the bishop. God bless you. Love you with the Lord. If you've been blessed through the word, we encourage you to sow into this ministry and be a blessing to this house. You bless this house, you'll bless your house. For this ministry absolutely is fertile ground. God bless you.